Welcome everyone and thank you for standing by. All participants will be in listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. I would also like to advise you that today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference over to Stephanie Shearholtz. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Shearholtz from NASA's Office of Communications. Thank you for joining us today to talk with experts about uh, science investigation and new solar arrays that will be part of the Crew-2 Expedition 65 mission aboard the International Space Station. Crew-2 is targeted for liftoff on Earth Day, Thursday, April 22nd at 6.11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center here in Florida. The Crew-2 flight will carry NASA astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Megan MacArthur who will serve as the mission's spacecraft commander and pilot, respectively, along with Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency JAXA astronaut Akiko Hoshide and European Space Agency astronaut Toma Pesquet, who will serve as mission specialist to the space station for a six-month science mission. The Crew Dragon with the astronauts aboard is scheduled to dock to the space station about 23 hours after launching, so about 5.30 a.m. Friday, April 23rd. Here to talk with us about some of the research and operations the Expedition 65 crew will support during their mission are David Brady, Associate Program Scientist for the International Space Station Program at NASA's Johnson Space Center, ISS U.S. National Laboratory Senior Program Manager Dr. Liz Warren, who will discuss tissue engineering and microgravity, Dr. Lucy Lowe from the National Institutes of Health, who will discuss tissue chips, ISS Program Scientist for Earth Observations, Dr. William Stefanoff, who will discuss crew Earth observations, NASA Project Manager for International Space Station Power Augmentation, Brian Griffiths, and from Boeing, Rick Golden, Director of ISS Structural and Mechanical Development Project, who will talk about the new solar arrays, and Shantanu Jain, Senior Student at New York University, Abu Dhabi, and Team Lead for the Trine Investigation, that will study the, that will the, an experiment that will study microgravity's effects on the human immune system. So our speakers will provide a brief overview of the research, and we'll open the lines for a few questions after each speaker. If we have time at the end, we'll open up the lines for additional questions. Uh, new this time, we do have an image gallery to accompany our discussion today. You can find that uh, linked from nasa.gov/live. Your phones are on mute now. To get into the question queue, you can press star one on your phone at any time. Um, reminder, we will take questions for each speaker right after they talk, and then uh, questions at the end for anybody. If we have time, um, we'll allow you to ask a second question, but we are going to try to stick to the hour since we, NASA has the Mars helicopter briefing immediately following this telecon. About one hour after we conclude, you can listen to a replay of the teleconference by dialing toll-free 800-551-8154. Again, that number is 800-551-8154. So to start us off, we'll hear from David Brady, our Associate Program Scientist for the International Space Station Program at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. Over to you, David. Thanks, Stephanie. You know, when I go into these events, I'm always looking forward to, to talking to folks and to provide information that's good for their audiences. So sometimes I get questions, what, what research are you going to talk about for this upcoming event? And, and what I often say is that when I'm supporting an event where we have the researchers, the project managers associated with it, I try to say very little about the details of the research because I love doing that whenever I'm talking to an audience where the researchers aren't there. I love presenting all of the really neat things they're doing, all the beneficial things they're doing for humanity, for exploration, commercialization, and for science. But in an in a event like this, where you can hear it from their own, from their own, in their own words, I think what's more useful to you potentially in your audiences is to talk a little bit about the context. So I'm gonna briefly talk about how the commercial crew program vehicles provide benefits for ISS research, some context that you might not hear otherwise before you get to hear about all the cool things going on in details from the researchers themselves. Now, I think most of y'all are familiar 
with the fact that when we fly more crew members, we get more crew time on orbit for research. Uh, in fact, compared to the previous baseline that we had a few years ago of three U.S. orbital segment astronauts on orbit, uh, our current baseline allows us to do to have crew time capable of doing of over double the previous amount that we were doing during that time frame. But there's a, a few other points uh, I wanted want to make that may be a little more uh, less talked about or less obvious to you. For, for example, these new vehicles allow us to adjust launch and landing time and mission duration to make it more adaptable to the research objectives. Most of you in your audiences are probably familiar with our one-year missions that we've flown, like Scott Kelly's mission a few years ago. What you may or may not know is that we have a program called Standard Measures, a research program called Standard Measures. Because things in the human body change at different rates, when you're looking to figure out what happens over a long duration mission, you need different mission durations to, to determine that. So we look at everything from one month up to one year or so. And that's one thing that these new vehicles are going to provide to us is that sort of mission duration and launch and landing time uh, adjustments. Uh, because these vehicles launch from Florida and because they, they land here near in, in the United States or near the United States coastline, we can get better science because we have easier access both to the launch and landing sites. And what I mean by that is that we reduce the time from lab to launch pad as well as the time from landing site back to the lab. And this is particularly beneficial for life science samples, which usually require special handling like cold stowage. In addition, these vehicles provide much more science mass on the crew vehicles than what we've had in the past on the order of hundreds of pounds or kilograms versus tens of pounds or kilograms. And all of these capabilities that I've just reviewed are particularly useful to life science, including human research. This will result in benefits to people on Earth for human exploration objectives, as well as for commercial life science and biotechnology companies. So with that, I hope that gives you an idea of the sort of capability we have here and sets the stage for what the researchers are going to tell you. That's great, David. Thank you so much for that great introduction. You bet. Uh, and so if, if you have a question for David, we'll take that at the end and we'll keep moving on to our first uh, scientist to speak with us about a specific investigation. So we will hear from uh, Dr. Liz Warren from the ISS US National Laboratory about tissue engineering and microgravity. Dr. Warren is a physiologist and has been involved in spaceflight research for almost 30 years. At the ISS National Lab, part of her role is to foster scientific and technological innovation and help inspire the next generation of explorers. So Dr. Warren, over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. I am very excited to be here today on behalf of the ISS US National Laboratory. We work via a cooperative agreement with NASA to sponsor research and technology development investigations that support utilization of our amazing orbital laboratory through both fundamental and applied research concepts, bringing value back to our nation and driving a robust and sustainable market in low Earth orbit. We are so excited for the launch of Crew-2. These astronauts, along with the other astronauts already aboard the space station, will be engaged with a variety of investigations over the coming months. And I'll provide a brief overview on the diversity of research that will be launched and performed during their stay. Now, a number of the investigations within the ISS National Lab portfolio that have flown in recent increments and will continue to fly with the support of NIH, NSF, and industry are in the field of tissue engineering. Tissue engineering is an interdisciplinary field that applies principles from engineering and from life sciences toward the development of constructs that restore, regenerate, or replace biological tissues. Now, as you can imagine, bioengineered materials then have tremendous potential for clinical applications. And by that, 
think of examples such as artificial skin to treat burns, cardiac tissue regeneration for the treatment of heart failure, nerve regeneration for treatment of stroke, lung regeneration for treatment of lung disease. But they are also valuable as a tool for discovery of novel therapeutics. And we'll hear more about that in a little bit. So, however, in the field of tissue engineering, we're still confronted by a number of challenges. And while we see hope and anticipation in the number of clinical trials that are ongoing in the field, we still have yet to see the full expanse of significant impacts. Now, there's a number of factors that remain challenges for the field of tissue engineering to solve. And that's why we're hopeful that the use of the ISS could help expedite some of these future benefits from, uh, from, uh, from realizing, from being realized. So that brings me to a really good question. Why then are we sending tissue engineering investigations to the space station? Well, we know that cells communicate with each other and that this communication is critical for their proper functioning. We don't fully understand why, but in microgravity, cell-to-cell -cell communication works differently than it does in a two-dimensional cell culture flask here on Earth. Cells also aggregate or gather together differently in microgravity. They gather in a more three-dimensional way. These features allow cells to behave more like they do when they're inside the body. Thus, microgravity appears to provide a unique opportunity for tissue engineering. ISS National Lab has already launched several investigations that fit under the broad tissue engineering umbrella. These include a lung tissue recellularization study, a 3D bioprinter, in-space production of a retinal implant, and organoid and tissue chip investigations, which could be used as disease models. The Crew-2 astronauts will be on board to perform an investigation on engineered skeletal muscle that is sponsored by the NSF, and you'll hear more about tissue chips in space launching during this increment from our next speaker, Dr. Lucy Lowe from the National Institutes of Health. Now, real briefly, I wanted to touch a little bit on uh, the larger breadth of research scheduled to launch during this increment. There's a sustainability-focused project examining responses of cotton plants to limited water availability. And this is toward potential development of cotton cultivars that use water more efficiently. This project is funded by Target Corporation. A couple of other highly recognizable companies are looking at creating better products and therapeutics for consumers and patients on Earth. The first is from Colgate. They're going to be launching a biofilm investigation. Eli Lilly and company is going to be launching a lyophilization investigation. Both of these companies uh, are either having sent several payloads already to the space station or are just starting a series. Also, student investigations, Genes in Space, sponsored by Boeing, will be launching its eighth investigation to the space station. Over the years, this program has engaged thousands of students in proposing concepts related to RNA and DNA-related payloads. So this is a real quick snapshot of the many payloads that will be performed as part of the Crew-2 astronauts' time on the space station. As we near those cargo launches and this launch, please follow us on Twitter at ISS underscore cases, or go to our website at issnationallab.org to learn more about the array of science flying under the sponsorship of the ISS National Lab and the value that these investigations bring to our nation. So go SpaceX, go Dragon, and Godspeed Crew 2. Thank you, Dr. Warren. That's great. If you have a question about tissue engineering or other uh, ISS National Lab investigations Dr. Warren mentioned, you can go ahead and press star one to get into the queue, but we will hold those questions until after our next speaker. So uh, next we will hear from Dr. Lucy Lowe from the National Institutes of Health about tissue chips, complex 
bioengineered 3D models that mimic the structure and function of human organ systems. Dr. Lowe is a scientific program manager at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences at the National Institutes of Health, or NIH. She manages the Tissue Chips for Drug Screening Program, including the Chips in Space Program, where the NIH is sending biomedical research to the International Space Station. She is a neuroscientist who's trained in the United Kingdom and completed postdoctoral research at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and the NIH. Over to you, Dr. Lowe. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Stephanie, for that introduction. And also, thank you, Liz, for a really great introduction to tissue engineering and uh, some of the principles that apply to tissue chips here as well. So, uh, yes, uh, what are tissue chips and what on earth are we doing sending them to space? So, tissue chips, as Stephanie very nicely explained, are small bioengineered devices that contain human cells and tissues that are designed to mimic and to replicate the structure and function of human organs and tissues in these small devices. And we can use them to model different kinds of diseases using all kinds of genetic techniques and various different cellular inclusions. And we can also use them to test drugs and different therapeutics. And these are really important tools in the drug development process because importantly, they can model human tissues in a way that is much more replicable and applicable to real full-size humans than just looking at two-dimensional cell layers in a dish or even when just using animal models. So uh, tissue chips are really helpful tools that we can use to try and understand human health and disease. And the reason that we have partnered with the ISS National Lab and NASA to send them to the space station is because, as I'm sure you all know, astronauts undergo quite a lot of physiological changes when they go into microgravity. And this is very interesting for us down here on Earth because the changes that they seem to show look very similar to some kinds of disease or aging states down here on Earth. And so what we can actually do is, is these changes happen on a really, really short time scale. And what this means is that we can start to model these changes on tissue chips over a very short time period that could take months or potentially even years to manifest as a clinical problem down here on Earth. So the example that we always give is uh, uh, astronauts see uh, loss of their bone density very, very quickly when they go up to the space station. And that looks very similar to something like osteoporosis down here on Earth. But that can take decades to actually become a clinical problem. So we're able to use the microgravity environment with our tissue chips to look at these cellular and molecular changes on a very, very fast time scale, and therefore use it as a tool to model lots of clinically relevant disease states. And we can uncover new potential pathways, molecular pathways to investigate these disease states, and also test existing or repurposed or even brand new drugs in this environment to then translate those findings into clinically relevant, important findings down here on Earth. So the NIH has funded and the ISS National Lab has funded nine teams who have each had two flight opportunities throughout the program. And the first flight was mainly to test their systems and check that the tissues do what they're supposed to do. And then the second flight is to really get into that disease modeling and start testing drugs in the systems. So the Crew 2 uh, team are going to be very busy with a number of our investigations that are getting launched this year on their second flights. We have a kidney team launching later on this year as well who are modeling uh, kidney stones and the formation of kidney stones, which uh, happens very rapidly in microgravity. We have teams looking at aging of the immune system. We have teams looking at lung infection and how microgravity affects the immune response, which after the pandemic of the last year or two has been uh, obviously a pretty, pretty important clinically relevant area to look at. And uh, so we're really excited that the Crew 2 uh, astronauts are going to be very busy with lots of our experiments. And uh, I'm looking forward to taking questions when we get round to that point. So thank you, Stephanie. Thank you both, uh, Dr. Warren and Dr. Lowe. So we will take some questions now for the two of them. Uh, if you have a question, please dial star one to get into the queue. Um, in the meantime, do you want to tell us, Dr. Lowe, um, what you hope to find from some of this research into uh, kidney stones, immune system, and lung function? Yes, absolutely. So. Um, one of the things that we're looking at or the teams will be looking at with their uh, experiments is now that they're testing drugs in the system is 
how these drugs affect the very fast changes that are seen that are associated with microgravity. Because what this means is that we're going to be able to start understanding how these drugs work on a much faster time scale than any way that we could do those kinds of experiments here on Earth. So we're very excited to see how the uh, expedited changes that we have seen during microgravity are affected by no drugs of known action. But we also have some of our teams are going to be looking at new drugs, so drugs that are of interest because they have certain molecular actions down here on Earth but are very difficult to model on the time scale that we can do down here on Earth because it could take a really, really long time for disease-associated changes to be able to be modeled in this kind of tissue chip. So we're very excited to be able to, uh, to use this expedited um, access to this kind of disease modeling state with new drugs as well so that we can potentially then translate those findings into, uh, into the drug development process down here on Earth. And Stephanie, I think we're maybe on mute. Oh, thank you for that, Rachel. I uh, appreciate that. Um, so uh, we thank you both Dr. Lowe and Dr. Warren for uh, those excellent explanations. We, at this time, uh, have a question from David Curley for you. Thanks very much for taking the call. I, I have a much broader question. Where we are today on science and research in space, are we going to learn more uh, by testing and doing the kind of experiments you are? There's been a lot of talk about production of certain drugs or other things in space. Do you have a sense which is going to be more important over the next decade or so? This is... Liz Warren, can, I want to actually ask you a clarifying question, if you don't mind. Can you repeat what you were saying about what the advantage? What, what is your question? So uh, we've been using the space station uh, for experiments, uh, both on on biologicals and then some manufacturing techniques as well. I'm just trying to get a sense from from you, broader picture. Is space going to be the place for research or production, or is it a 50-50 venture? May I can address that if you want, unless you want sure, to, Liz. Yeah, yeah it's, it's all of the above. It's, uh, I was just talking to a group the other day, and uh, they were asking about, do we do 3D printing in space? And I said, yes, both organic and inorganic, and in addition to some of the things that Lucy and Liz have been talking about here as well. If you think about it, um, some things, like when Lucy's talking about new drugs, and I'll let her correct me if I say this incorrectly as in terms of, of their intentions, um, if you have to select for new drugs, drugs and you can have an accelerated model in space or, an, or a, a, you know, a, an environment that provides you with data faster, then you can select new drugs and decide which to go on. At the same time, you may be working on a therapeutic that you hope to work, and you're looking at acceleration there. With regards to the other, uh, Liz touched on uh, the bioprinting that we're doing as well, and we think that that's going to be very important, and there may be certain advantages to doing that in microgravity. We're also looking at in-space manufacturing with things like fiber optic cables. So. And, and in addition to that, the 3D printing will be very important for long-term, long-duration space flight. If you can determine the raw materials to bring and some form of manufacturing there on your way to Mars or somewhere else, you're in a much better position to be flexible in terms of what you produce with that. Again, assuming you can set up a system that we are trying to set up on the space station and demonstrate that it works and it's reliable for something like a, a mission to Mars. So hopefully that answers your question. It's not a one or the other. And as far as percentage, I, I wouldn't even venture to guess because we're pursuing all of these to see what's applicable to exploration, what's applicable here on Earth, uh, what is fundamental science discoveries. And some of these may be very useful also 
for the commercial development of low Earth orbit. Thank you for that explanation, David. That's very helpful. And our next question comes from Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now. Hi, this is Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now. I think my question is for David Brady as well. Um, you've had four USO, US OS crew members on the station now for uh, a half a year or more. I'm just curious, uh, you know, with that experience, with the uh, with that extra crew member, um, has the science program really hit a stride over these last recent months with four uh, crew members on board? And how many hours of science or utilization are you getting per week right now? And how does that compare to the number you had with three USOS crew members? Thanks. Yeah, Stephen, thank you. Thank you for your question here. Um, we talk about this a lot in our office. And the way we characterize this now is we say it's more than double is our capability. Uh, because what has happened is what is exactly what we wanted to happen, and that is we didn't want crew time to continue to be our limiting factor, which is what it was under three USOS crew members. So when you add an additional crew member to that, you will about double. Now, once you get to that point, you start getting into other factors like mass and volume constraints of flying the science to and from the station, stowage constraints on the station, uh, the fact that we have uh, – limited facilities. For example, we have two glove boxes, and so if you end up with more experiments that want to use the glove box, that may slow you down and allow and prevent you from getting more science. Um, and we try and plan our science on the ground to make sure things like that don't happen, but inevitably, since it is science, you, you never know when you're going to have to pull a payload or add a payload. Um, so to answer your question, uh, the numbers show us that we are getting the benefits uh, out of having the additional crew members and that crew time is no longer limiting us like it was with three USOS crew members. But the numbers also are based now on other factors, so they don't necessarily show that just because you fly X number of crew members, you're going to get more, because at this point, other factors are starting to intervene. I hope that paints a picture of what, what we're looking at here and how our change in our number of crew members due to CCP has, has influenced uh, our ability to do science. Great, thank you, David. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, with that, we'll move on to our next investigator. Our launch is targeted for Earth Day, and we are all connected by Earth. So next up is Dr. William Stefanoff, who's the International Space Station Program Scientist for Earth Observations. And he'll talk to us a little bit about the Crew Earth Observations Project, which uh, astronauts take pictures of Earth from the space station, and that contributes to one of the longest running records of how Earth has changed over time. Uh, he provides subject matter expertise to the space station program in the areas of Earth science and remote sensing, and he leads the ISS Earth Observations Working Group. He's directly involved in astronaut training for orbital scientific observation and data collection, specifically natural hazards and disaster response. Over to you, Dr. Stefanoff. Thank you, Stephanie, and uh, hello, everyone. Yes, uh, as mentioned, uh, the International Space Station uh, provides a useful platform for a number of different Earth observations instruments, uh, externally and internally mounted. But the, one of the unique aspects of the space station compared to other orbiting platforms that have instruments for Earth observations is the presence of humans, the presence of a crew on the space station. And this allows the crew to uh, use handheld cameras to take images of the Earth. And this is an activity that has been going on the space station since it was initially occupied in 2000. So at present, there have now been over 3.5 million images of the Earth taken by astronauts on board the International Space Station. Now, these cameras that the crew uses are commercial off-the-shelf equipment. They're cameras that you yourself could buy here at a, admittedly, a, probably a fairly high-end camera shop here on Earth or an online, uh, online, online location. But the, the crew takes advantage of the fact that there are a number of different windows on the ISS providing views that look straight down on the surface of the Earth from the position of the ISS, which would be very similar to kind of your traditional remote sensing instruments in orbit on free-flying satellite platforms. 
but they also have the capability to look at oblique images, uh, sort of similar to what you might see if you're in an airplane and taking a picture out of the airplane window. You get that sort of broad panoramic look and it gives you an, an angled view of the, the land surface. And uh, this is very important for certain types of uh, disaster response imagery, which is one of the things that the crew takes a very a much a big proportion of imagery over. It's one of their priority targets while they're on orbit. For example, a tropical cyclone uh, hurricane. With the ability to take this oblique imagery and the nadir facing imagery, the straight down looking imagery, that enables us to essentially capture a storm event throughout its entire life cycle. Uh, the crew can take imagery of the area where the storm is going to hit before the storm reaches landfall. So we have our pre-imagery. Then we can take imagery of the storm system itself, which uh, is very important for scientific researchers who are using it to, say, assess storm strength based on cloud heights within a tropical storm eye wall. And then we can also take imagery of the area after the storm has passed so that we can begin to assess uh, damage from the storm. And this is something that we do on a, on a frequent basis. We've actually been doing it from the ISS since 2012, and we support the international disaster response community in responding to these kinds of events. We collect data from the ISS and we deliver it to the United States Geological Survey which is the U.S. government agency that actually interfaces with the rest of the international community to get this data out. We also support a number of external science requests. For example, since the uh, coronavirus pandemic has been ongoing, we've had a number of external science requests for nighttime imagery of various cities around the world. And that's specifically to look at changes in nighttime lighting due to reduced activity, uh, reduced people driving, driving cars around cities or just going out into cities at night. And so we support a number of, of investigations uh, along those lines. And all of this data, as I mentioned, the, the, uh, the space station data is over three and a half million images, but uh, our online database uh, has imagery dating back to the Mercury programs, the NASA Mercury programs of the 1960s. And that provides one of the longest term uh, image records of the land surface of the Earth. And we've recently made a lot of strides in that data to make it much more accessible to the public and also to uh, identify features in the imagery so that much more of this database can be, can be accessed. And uh, the place that you can access that data is if you do a, a search in your favorite search engine, you can search on Gateway to Astronaut Photography of Earth, and that will take you to the, to the site. Uh, if you're looking for a URL, that would be https colon backslash eol.jsc.nasa.gov. And uh, I think I'll leave it there, and um, I'd be happy to take any uh, questions. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one to get in the queue. Uh, I have a question for you, which is how can uh, anyone use these images or request images tracking a specific phenomena? Typically, for, if we're tracking a specific phenomena, the way, the way the process works is once an event occurs or is thought to occur, like say a hurricane has formed in the Atlantic and it's going to, it's going to hit uh, coastal Florida we will then receive a request either through, say, the International Disaster Charter, or uh, we also work with the NASA Disasters Program to uh, get notification of the event up to the crew with specific information on what the event is, what kind of imagery we're looking for. And then once they obtain imagery, uh, they will then downlink that to the ground. Our team here at JSC will process it, will fully georeference the imagery, and then we'll send it out to the U.S. Geological Survey and they will disseminate it to whatever, whatever international agency requested the data in the first place. For uh, external science requests on the same site that I mentioned earlier, there is a, a proposal submission interface where you can provide uh, actual science requests. And those are the only kind of requests that we take. We take, we take science requests. We don't typically support 
commercial requests or things of that nature. That's, that's for our, uh, our colleagues in the ISS National Lab uh, to take care of. Okay, great. And uh, we have a question from Jeff Faust of Space News. Hi, a uh, question. Um, given this large data set, are you aware of uh, any efforts to use things like um, machine learning algorithms, artificial intelligence, so on, to do processing of the images for change detection or other techniques, given that's becoming increasingly in vogue in other parts of Earth observation? Yes, yes, absolutely. In fact, we, we have a team that uh, is specifically applying machine learning techniques to our database uh, to produce higher level data products, such as cloud masks from the data, and we're working on automated feature identification for things to, to enable things like automated flood mapping and uh, other, other items of that. It's automatic identification of specific urban centers, all so that those tags can be added to the data in the database and provide much greater search, uh, search opportunities for the public. Great, thank you. And um, Dr. Stefanoff, do you uh, have citizen uh, volunteers who help you with the imagery identification as well? We do. We have a program that we call the Image Detective Program, which we invite uh, private citizens to help us identify uh, features in our imagery. And that's also available through the website that I mentioned. We also have uh, cooperative agreements with, with some universities to engage students to do this work as well. So yes, we, we have engagement on, on a number of different levels. Cool. Uh, we have a question from David Curley of Discovery Channel. Doctor, do you have an anecdote for us about um, a request that was made and you found something that helped uh, the researcher or the, the meteorologist or whomever uh, requested some information? Yes, in fact, uh, I think probably a good example of that is a project that was known uh, as the Tropical Cyclone Project. That is where we were supporting investigators uh, who were collecting stereographic imagery of tropical cyclone eye walls. I kind of alluded to this earlier. Their, pro their whole project was as the ISS passed over a, an active cyclone, uh, active tropical cyclone, they would take stereo imagery as they passed over. To, through using that stereo imagery, they were able to then calculate relative cloud heights within the eye wall. And those cloud heights, they were able to develop algorithms that related that cloud height directly to the storm strength. And so by doing this over time, they were able to get a better understanding of how the storm's uh, eye wall changes reflected the changing storm strength. And that relates directly into the ability to predict uh, storm power and duration for events of this type. Okay, great. Uh, one more question for you. Do you have a favorite or memorable image? It's, it's hard to choose. There, there are so many, but yes, I, I do in fact have a favorite image. It's a, an image of a, a volcanic eruption that took place uh, in the Coral Island chain. And this imagery captured a very particular and unusual cloud formation that can form over powerful volcanic eruptions. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a favorite image because this was the first time that that particular cloud formation had been captured from orbit by any sensor. And it was captured by an astronaut taking a picture out of the International Space Station. So that would be my favorite. Excellent. Well, if that's not in the gallery that we posted, we'll make sure we get that added. Okay, thank you very much. That's fascinating. We'll move on to our next uh, item, which is to talk about new solar arrays. So this summer is the next SpaceX Cargo, Cargo Dragon that will arrive uh, to the space station in June is scheduled to bring along the first pair of a total of six new solar arrays that will be added to the orbiting laboratory in the coming years to augment the station's power. Here to talk with us today about these new arrays are Brian Griffith, the NASA Project Manager for ISS Power Augmentation, and Rick Golden, Boeing's Director for the ISS Structural and Mechanical Development Project. Rick Golden began working for Boeing in 1994 uh, and has worked on various roles for the ISS program going back to 1988 and currently leads ISS development projects, among other tasks. And uh, Brian has led this solar array project for NASA. So, Brian, why don't you get us started and then pass it over to Rick? Absolutely. Uh, 
So to put the project in context, our eight legacy solar arrays were launched to the ISS and the Space Shuttle payload bay beginning in December of 2000 with an expected service life of 15 years. Uh, two of those arrays, in particular the Channel 2B and 4B arrays, which live on the outermost port truss segment known as P6, have exceeded that service life by over five years. And we have four additional channels that will meet that milestone in uh, 2021 and 2022. Although our legacy solar arrays continue to function very well, uh, as they continue to age, the needs of our science payload and advanced technology users, our ISS systems, our international partner, and our commercial commitments uh, will begin to exceed the power generation capability we have on ISS more and more frequently. Uh, and this will inevitably lead to loss of valuable science opportunities. The ISS Power Augmentation Project is working to supply the ISS with six new solar arrays to supplement that power generation capability beginning in increment 65. These arrays uh, are based at its heart on the Rollout Solar Array, or ROSA, technology developed by, the de by deployable space systems demonstrated on ISS in June of 2017 on the SpaceX CRS-11 mission. Key features of this technology include a flexible solar array blanket, which is deployed by spring energy stored in a cylindrical boom that's been split and rolled along its long axis, so no motors are, uh, are included at all. Our larger ISS solar arrays feature two blankets, which have been hinged in the middle to fit within the uh, allowable ISS visiting vehicle external cargo volumes. At launch, each array will measure approximately 10 feet by 4 feet by 2 feet in its stowed, that is, its rolled and then folded configuration. Once that array has been unfolded and deployed on orbit, They'll measure approximately 60 feet long by 20 feet wide and will produce at least 20 kilowatts of power for its 10-year design service life. These arrays will be launched in pairs stacked on the IPA carrier flight support equipment uh, as external cargo in the SpaceX Dragon trunk beginning with our next cargo flight, SpaceX 22. Installation of each array requires two space walks, one for worksite preparation and one for IROSA installation and deploy for a total of 12 EVAs through 2023. These arrays will be structurally connected to the existing beta gimbal assembly or BGA mass canisters via a set of seven struts known as the IPA modification kits. In fact, the 2B and 4B modification kits were installed uh, recently on US EVA 71 and 72. Once deployed, the uh, IROSAs will form a 10 degree angle above the uh, existing legacy arrays. Two Y cables per array will allow the ISS rollout solar arrays to feed power directly into the existing primary power distribution hardware, which minimizes changes to the ISS power architecture. Although these new arrays will shade approximately 55% of the existing arrays, the unshielded legacy strings will continue to supply another seven to nine kilowatts of power to the ISS, which brings the total power of each augmented channel close to its original original 30 kilowatt capability at launch. At completion, the six augmented channels and the two legacy channels will together produce approximately 215 kilowatts to support space station operations, science investigations, and technology demonstrations into the future. Uh, Rick, do you have anything to, uh, to add? I think the only thing I'd add, Brian, is the modularity of ISS and the beauty of its original design and that these original arrays were never intended to be upgraded and they're not orbital re replacement units. And here we are some 20 years later due to the modularity of our, exist our original design being able to upgrade solar arrays, which leads us to believe the structure can operate well into the future to support not only science and research, but, but uh, deep space exploration as a test bed, as well as LEO commercialization. Excellent. Yeah, I find that fascinating that, you know, we're able to do these things on station that, that weren't even designed or thought of or planned at the beginning uh, of its construction. So thank you for that excellent explanation. We also have a web feature on NASA's website about the new solar arrays, and that has uh, both an image of the arrays as well as um, uh, an illustration of the future configuration. So 
If you have a question related to the arrays, please press star one to get into the queue. In the meantime, uh, well, let's see. Uh, we have, first we have Mark Corot from Aviation Week. Uh, thank you very much. Um, could you explain, um, I know June is the date for the first two. Uh, what does it look like for the, the four others? And uh, when would you think, um, you know, even on a rough time scale, that all the spacewalks would be complete to, to do the installation of all uh, six? So our project targets are uh, manifesting on SpaceX 25 and SpaceX 26. Although uh, those um, those manifests are under review um, due to industry-wide uh, COVID impacts on uh, on a lot of the uh, ISS um, launch hardware. Uh, so, uh, in answer to your question, uh, you know we expect to uh, to install the second set of arrays in 2022. And the third set will be no later than 2023. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is from Jeff Faust of Space News. Hi, I was curious uh, how these arrays differ from some of the other ROSA arrays that have been developed <clears throat> or being developed for the uh, power and propulsion element or the uh, DART mission. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, so at DSS, uh, DART was our uh, immediate predecessor. It is uh, a considerably smaller array um, as uh, that's been particularly sized for uh, for its mission. Um, although you know we do benefit from the uh, the same basic technologies and uh, and did learn a lot in the manufacturing process as uh, as DART preceded us. Uh, PPE is the, uh, the the next array in line after the uh, the iRoses are complete, and I understand that they are uh, uh, quite a bit larger and uh, and produce quite a bit more power. Um, and so uh, we're working closely with uh, with the Gateway folks to uh, to help them with uh, with lessons that we've gained along the way as well. I'll add a, just a tad to that, Brian. So the PPE. Uh, well, let me back up. So the ISS arrays that are in development, about to fly, those are based on Spectrolab uh, photovoltaic cells, which is in contrast to d both DART as well as PPE, which will use another solar cell. Uh, the the Spectrolab cells are are more powerful than those other arrays. The DART arrays, as Brian said, are much smaller. Uh, the PPE is is go is going to be larger than ours. The big difference in these arrays, other than the solar cells, are really the size of the mast, that or excuse me, the booms that deploy the arrays, and those are the carbon tubes that are on the outside of the arrays, and and they operate much the same way. They just have a different diameter to the booms that drop, you know, due to a heavier blanket with with the uh, PV cells on it, is, but other than that, they work fundamentally uh, exactly the same. Okay, that's very helpful. Uh, thank you both for talking to us about the new solar arrays. Uh, finally, we'll move on to our last uh, scientist for this call. Uh, Shantanu Jain is a senior student at New York University Abu Dhabi and team lead for the CHIME investigation, which will study microgravity's effects on the human immune system. Shantanu is a senior undergraduate student at New York University uh, Abu Dhabi, where he's majoring in computer science with minors in applied math and natural sciences. Can you tell us what CHIME stands for and how this investigation will help us understand the human immune system in space? Yes, of course. Thanks for the intro, Stephanie. So um, we're a team of undergraduates um, from New York University's Abu Dhabi campus, and um, we wanted to sort of try and understand how the human, human immune system behaves differently in microgravity versus on Earth. Um, and this project uh, is supported by the United Arab Emirates Space Agency, um, and their test and orbit program. And it's actually the first automated science experiment being sent to the space station from the UAE. So what's the big idea behind our project? Um, first off, CHIME stands for Characterizing Human 
immunodeficiency in microgravity environments. Bit of a mouthful, so we decided to call it CHIME. Um, but the big idea here is that abnormal immune responses in humans are a well-documented scenario in microgravity, especially during extended exposure in environments like that of the International Space Station. And so that was really the basic motivation behind our experiment. And we wanted to understand whether one specific method for the creation of immune cells in humans is affected adversely because of microgravity. In particular, we were interested in how simple monocyte cells differentiate into more complex and specialized immune cells called macrophages. So macrophages uh, play an important role in the immune system as they attack harmful pathogens and um, they eliminate other foreign material in the body by essentially digesting them. And um, the way we did this was uh, by develop developing a payload, um, and that payload is a 1.5 U nanolab, and it's roughly four by four by six inches, so it's pretty small. Um, and this will go on to be plugged into nano the NanoRax frame, which is a permanent fi fixture on the space station, and it can support up to 12 nanolab experiments like ours. So, like I mentioned, it's a pretty small enclosure, and so that was one of the major challenges we had to overcome while developing this. And the challenge here is that um, we have to ensure that cells grow healthily while on station, and we can interact, uh, we can have them interact with different chemicals at specific times that will cause the desired changes in them, much like we would do ourselves in a lab on Earth. And that is usually a manual process with specialized equipment to make sure that the cells don't die and, you know, the procedure is successful and we can have the experiment that we want. So what we ended up doing is we miniaturized and automated that process of growing and treating cells to fit the size and power constraints that we faced. This allowed us to run a complete experiment on the space station without any human intervention. And we accomplished this using microfluidics technology that brought our experiment down to a very small scale. What the experiment is, is we will be treating um, the cells, the monocyte cells to start with, with certain chemicals at different points in time um, to have them transition from a monocyte to a macrophage. And then what we will do is at certain points during that process, we will introduce chemicals that will freeze the characteristics of those cells at that point in time. This will allow us to get a, a more detailed insight into the cell's journey from a monocyte to a macrophage. And then obviously we have to have a control experiment so what we'll do is we'll compare them to cells that have gone the exact same process on Earth to see the differences. And more specifically, we will be looking at the differences in the expression of genes uh, between the cells in space and the ones on Earth that have undergone the same process to understand the effects of microgravity on that process. Um, and we're, we're excited by this uh, project, uh, especially because um, because of two things, right? Um, both from the bio uh, side of things where we have the opportunity to better understand human immunity in space when there's so much talk of uh, extended space travel. So it's, it's really one of the key components. But also from an engineering perspective, this is very exciting for us because um, it, it will be a proof of concept for small, low-cost automated payloads that can conduct experiments like these. Um, which have traditionally required human intervention to uh, make sure that the cells um, stay alive throughout the procedure. Um, and we were able to accomplish this with a very diverse team. We had uh, biologists, phys uh, physicists, engineers, computer scientists um, that all came together to make uh, this project happen. Um, we also come from all over the world, from Australia to India to the U.S. And um, this project was really made possible through the continued support of the UA Space Agency um, and their launch partner, NanoRax. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. No? Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, if you have a question, please dial star one to get into the queue. Uh, why don't you tell us what potential results you might be expecting from this mission and the implication of those? Right. So we, uh, there, there have been studies that have shown um, microgravity adversely affects macrophages, and macrophages are a key sort of linking element in the, in the human immune system. And so, you know, the, the biological result that we're hoping for is, is we understand the genes that are important um, uh, in the sense that those are the ones whose expression is changed due to microgravity, and this can lead to both a better understanding and maybe potential, um, you know, clinical implications. 
to ensure that humans don't fall sick as easily as they uh, might right now. Um, and like I mentioned, the, the second uh, part of it that we're excited about is, is really increasing access to space science. Um, you know, for even student researchers like us or for, you know, other researchers um, with, uh, who don't have as many resources but still want to conduct these experiments, I think this will be a very good proof of concept um, that can be taken further to develop payloads that can accomplish um, interesting biological experiments um, with a low cost, um, a low power um, demand from the space station and also not having to use a valuable crew time while um, on the space station. So I think those are the two sort of results that we're very excited for. Excellent. So you're, you're helping David Brady solve for his uh, uh, other problem that he said, now that they have crew time, they also uh, have other things. So that's, that's great. Um, exactly. And you, you, you mentioned that you have a, a diverse team from all over. How did the pandemic affect your preparation for this mission? So, you know, we, uh, the pandemic was one thing that we did not account for when we started this project, you know, and none of us ever thought um, we'd live through such a time, but here we are. Um, I think, I think um, you know, it, it was really a testament to the team that they were able to come together and uh, collaborate virtually, um, you know, despite it being a very hands-on project. And um, even our university's resources, um, you know, we got access to labs um, for the few of us who were able to stay on campus. So really, we got a lot of support from our partners, you know, the UA Space Agency and NYU, um, to be able to, you know, weather the storm, so to speak. Um, and the team really just came together to really contribute, um, even through virtual means. So I think it was a um, it was a very good team effort to sort of work around the pandemic. That's great. Uh, thank you so much, and good luck to your team uh, at this time. I'll make a, a call for any other last questions for any of our speakers today. Uh, if you have a, a lingering question, please dial star one. And uh, in the meantime, I'll just remind you uh, to stay tuned for all of Crew 2 news to nasa.gov slash commercial crew. Uh, the blog there is being regularly updated with uh, in advance of the upcoming launch in the early hours tomorrow, Tuesday, April 20th, the SpaceX and NASA teams will conduct a launch readiness review, and we'll have a pre-launch news conference to follow that uh, about one hour after it concludes, no earlier than 8 a.m. Eastern time, and that will be broadcast on NASA TV, which you can also watch, of course, on the NASA app and on nasa.gov slash live. In addition, uh, you can find an image gallery for today's uh, Science Telecon at nasa.gov slash live. And thank you to everybody who called, participated, and listened uh, for discussing the important science, research, and technology that the Crew-2 astronauts will support as part of the six-month Expedition 65 mission aboard the International Space Station. Again, if you'd like to listen to a replay of this teleconference, you may do so by dialing 800-551-8154. Thank you all for joining us. That will conclude today's conference, and we thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time. Speakers, please stand by for your post-conference.